Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the webinar. Can you all see me? Okay, I'm not frozen. My name is Andrea Botazatu. I'm an associate professor and enology extension specialist with Texas A&M University, Texas AgriLife Extension Services, and this is part of our um, enology webinar series. Um, before I begin, just a little bit of housekeeping. As you probably know, if you've participated in these before, they're about 45 to 50 minutes long with a 10-minute Q&A session at the end. With that being said, you can type your questions as we go along in the chat bar or in the Q&A uh, box there, and we will be sure to answer all of your questions at the end um, of the presentation. Presentation is being recorded and it will be posted on my YouTube channel. Um, I think that's about it. Oh, there will be a survey at the end of the webinar, very short survey, just the four or five questions. It shouldn't take more than a minute or two of your time. So I would really appreciate um, if you took the time to fill out that survey. It helps me a lot in continuing my programming. And with that, I will ask our presenter, Eglantine Chauffour, to introduce herself and uh, continue with the presentation. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. So my name is Eglantine Chauffour. I'm um, the Enology Director at Booker Vaslan North America, and I also take care of La Motabie wine making product uh, in North America. Um, and today I will be talking about the wine phenolic compounds and uh, focusing mostly on color in red wines. Um, a little bit about uh, my background. So I have been, uh, well, I study winemaking. I have been making wine for the last um, oh, uh, almost uh, 13 years, actually. Um, it's, it's going um, fast. So I um, I'm more into, uh, I, I have been in production, uh, as all of you, um, before I still make my own wine actually on the side and uh, in US and here at uh, Booker Vassan North America I um, I have a technical role which uh, I'm here to uh, help for any type of technical question and a practical question regarding winemaking. So today I'm going to be uh, talking about the wine phenolic compounds and then if you have any question at the end um, well, as Andrea said, it um, ask everything you want, and you will have my contact too. So we are gonna talk about um, preserving and stabilizing the phenolic potential. So why are we talking about this? Is mostly because we work so hard to have beautiful grapes, which uh, we have an initial potential of a hundred percent. That depends of our variety, the maturity of the grapes, and the grape health. But that's really the first goal and the work of pretty much the full year calendar in uh, the vineyard is to get as much potential and as good potential as possible. Then once we arrive to the winemaking step, our approach is to um, keep this potential and express it in the final wine. So we want to have as much phenolic structure and color as possible in our final wine. And this will uh, be impacted by our um, extraction methods, how we protect our phenolic compounds and how we stabilize it or stabilize them. So that's what I'm going to talk about today, um, how to keep as much as possible our initial potential. So extract from the grapes, protect from oxidation or precipitation, and then stabilize them in the wine to keep them um, in the bottle. Okay, so before I go through these steps and more practical aspects, I want to go a little bit more in detail into which phenolic compounds we are talking about uh, in wine. There is many phenolic compounds. It's a pretty a big uh, family of uh, chemical compounds. They are present everywhere in the world on any plants, but also on any human and skin. Uh, we have them. Uh, so let's make sure we talk about the right one. So in wine, we can find non-hydrolyzable 
compounds, which are the non-flavonoids, they are present in the flesh, and the flavonoids that are present in the skin, in the seed, and in the stem. So these are the anthocyanins. Anthocyanins are uh, positively charged. They are uh, the molecules that are responsible of the color. Because they are positively charged, they are very unstable in wine. They are going to react with anything that is negatively charged around. They are responsible of the color, so we want them to react with something that will stabilize them to not lose them. So that's really one of our um, goal. first goal here is going to be to stabilize anthocyanin to keep the color. They are present in the skin, very easy to extract. So again, they are going to be the first compounds to extract in water, and we have to work on stabilizing them. Then we have the flavonols. Flavonols are part of the tannins. Uh, they are copigment. And there is some studies that show that um, the value of the wine can be actually very, it's, it's a pretty long study, but basically we did some tasting and we were asking people to uh, give a price uh, to the wine or a value to this wine, depending their taste. And so out of this tasting came that um, the wines with the higher content in flavonols were also associated with the higher value. Doesn't mean that the more flavonol you have, the more expensive you can sell your wine. It's just that in general, we understood that when there is more flavonols, people are um, having a better structure, bigger wine, and they think it's a more expensive wine. So that's just something uh, to consider. But the conclusion here is just that flavonols can be associated with a qualitative tannins with impact on the structure. Then we have condensed tannins. Condensed tannins are really what we look for in terms of structure and softness in the palate. They are repeating units of flavan uh, sriol. So they are all these little units and you can have very long chain, very short chain. Uh, usually in the skin, we have uh, longer chains. So the tannins are smoother and more um, pleasant. And in the seeds, we have the same, but with shorter chain, with catechin and epicatechins, which are uh, tannins that are very aggressive, usually very uh, reactive with protein, so very drying in our palate, but also very reactive with color. So we do want these tannins to stabilize color. We just don't want too much of them to not be aggressive in our palate. Then we have the family of the hydrolyzable uh, tannins, which are mostly coming from wood. So they are the gallic and elagic tannin. So when I say from wood, they come from barrels when we do barrel aging, but they also come from the stems, um, which is wood, in fact, when they are lignified. So gallic tannins, elagic tannins, uh, they react very strongly with protein. They are very good on oxygen radicals. We use them as antioxidants. Okay, so big difference family. The anthocyanin responsible of the color, the flavonol flavonols that can be copigment, so they are used to uh, react with anthocyanin, stabilize color, but also they participate to mouthfeel. The condensed tannins that are really the big part of uh, the structure of the wine and the body of the wine. And then on the other side, the uh, gallic and elagic tannins, the hydrolyzable tannins that come from the wood that are very good antioxidants. So I told you we're going to talk about extraction, protection, and stabilization. So the first step is how do we extract our phenolic compounds uh, from the grapes? OK, they are coming from there. We want to extract all the good compounds. Uh, we want to promote really the skin, um, the extraction from the skin, but limit the seed extraction, uh, especially if our seeds are not so ripe, which can happen very often if the grapes mature too fast. Usually the skin is great, but the seeds are not always um, at their top. This is the kinetics of extraction uh, of the skin compounds. So you can see both graphs kind of say the same thing, except that here we focus on the tannin. So the graph on the left, on the right, sorry, show you that we really the first thing we extract are the pigment, which are the anthocyanins. So because they are water soluble, we don't need alcohol to extract them. So as soon as you get in contact with the juice, we start to extract pigment. 
then the skin, skin tannins and the seeds tannins come after uh, when we start to have alcohol and higher temperature. The important part here is to understand that we are extracting first the anthocyanin, second the tannins, third the polysaccharide that are part of also um, skin. We need polysaccharide and tannins to stabilize anthocyanin. So we are going to need to work on how to extract faster tannins and polysaccharide to reach the peak of extraction in the same time than anthocyanin and protect our anthocyanin. We'll talk about this um, after the protection, but this is a very important graph to understand the kinetics. So remember that the anthocyanin comes out in uh, juice. So first thing we extract is anthocyanin. So we want to improve the extraction of these anthocyanins, but also extract more tannins and polysaccharide on the early stage of fermentation. How can we extract skin compounds or how do we impact the extraction of skin compounds? There is many ways. Um, the first one would be to crush. Uh, using crushing will actually increase the skin and seed extraction. So that's one thing that is good just because we um, have a mechanical action on the cells of the skin and we expose also the seeds. Uh, but uh, because we are crushing everything at once, we are increasing the risk of oxidation. This usually happens in an um, open environment, so there is air and oxygen all around. So you win on extraction, you lose on um, oxidation. Cold soak, cold soak, there is many studies on cold soak and it really depends on how long is your cold soak and which variety we are talking about, but not only, it's also depending on vintage because it really depends on how thick is your skin. So cold soak is um, debatable. Uh, sometimes it works great, sometimes it doesn't. And I can't really tell you uh, what to do um, because it, it depends on so many variables that we don't really know. Saigner, saigner is a method that works all the time. Your saigner means you are draining the juice. So basically you are changing your ratio juice skin. You are making more skin for less juice. We drain the juice, which basically concentrates. So it's not increasing the extraction. It's really a concentration of anthocyanin, skin tannin, and seed tannin. The downside of the saignée is, of course, that we are losing volume. Uh, commonly, we can make we make rosé from saignée. Um, I didn't tell you in the introduction, but I come from Provence. Uh, rosé is kind of um, one of my favorite topic, rosé wines. I really like to talk about this. And to make a good rosé, um, it's not going to happen through a saignée uh, on red grapes harvested for red wines. So we can make rosé out of it. We'll never make a fantastic rosé, but we can make a good rosé. We just have to work a little bit more on it because the grapes has been harvested for red wine. But to increase the value of your red, it is a very good um, method because you are increasing a lot the extraction and the concentration. Using sulfur, sulfur acts as a solvent. So that's one good thing. You are extracting more from the skin. You are also extracting everything. So not really recommended just because there is no selection at all. Uh, everything goes and you are bleaching all your color. So everything you try to extract gets bleached and not everything comes back. Uh, we say the bleaching color comes back, but we saw in many time, um, practically that it doesn't come back. So I would not recommend sulfur for this also because now the trend is really to reduce sulfur um, and we have so many good alternatives for sulfur that um, works great. That it's really not the topic I would uh, recommend. Extraction enzymes. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. Extraction enzymes are made to really focus on losing the cell walls of the skin, this increase the extraction uh, of juice, but also of um, compounds in the cells. So anthocyanin, tannins, polysaccharide too. Uh, you can do some uh, treatment like thermo or pressure treatment, thermo vinification, uh, vacuum or pressure, um, physical treatment that will improve the extraction. Cap management, of course, different um, 
way to do punch downs. So different time and different moments in the day. So how many times you do it by day, this will impact a lot. Punch down uh, or pump overs or delestage. We usually recommend to do delestage at the beginning of the fermentation. It's pretty aggressive if you do it at the end when there is alcohol and you will extract a lot of seed tannins. Um, pump over and punch down are very uh, gentle. Pump over could be tricky on the if you have whole cluster because of the stems and the seed extraction. The fermentation temperature, uh, that's something that uh, works very good. The higher you go, the more phenolic extraction you have, but also we realize the more polymeric pigments you have. So higher temperature allows you to have a more stable color because we are managing to polymerize uh, this anthocyanin and combine them, stabilize them. Just higher temperature, all the reaction goes faster. You just also have to think about your fermentation. Uh, you don't want a stack ferment. So higher temperature is manageable with the good yeast and the good nutrition um, for the yeast. Extended maceration is another way you will get more seed tannin and more polysaccharide. That can work too. Again, you have to think about the conditions. So extended maceration is great when you are uh, fully uh, healthy grapes. Uh, no problem that you don't want any microbiological problems because in extended maceration, that's where you have no sulfur. Usually it's pretty warm. There is no more yeast. You could have bacteria going on their own, Brettanomyces going there. It's a usually um, very unstable environment, microbiologically speaking. So you want to make sure you are safe on this topic. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about extraction enzyme. Um, just quickly, this is how uh, the um, grapes is. Basically, we are cutting the grape here transversally. Uh, and you can see that towards the skin, we are having very thick cell walls with very complex pectin matrix, um, branch pectin chain. There is a lot of cellulose, hemicellulose. It's very tough cell walls that are very hard to cut and also very hard to make the cells inside the, the compounds inside the cells being extracted. Uh, the first part here are the tannins, but that's why usually we need alcohol environment to lose down this pectin and to help the extraction of these tannins. The anthocyanin here um, are in the mid middle um, part of the cells and uh, are easier to extract. And then when we go to the um, flesh, the cells are very, uh, the walls of the cells are very thin, very easy to extract with linear pectin chain. That's where all the juice come, up, come from. Want to show you what happened when we use an enzyme. So here we are uh, showing you um, a test which is called the coloration of a uh, sheaf test. It's basically the coloration of the polysaccharide present in the cell walls. So the polysaccharide are showing you all the complex pectin matrix and all the pectin chain. And we are uh, looking at here at how we can lose down this chain to extract better. So the control here is you can see how thick are the cells. Uh, the control is all pink, which means there is polysaccharide everywhere. We used uh, an enzyme here, like a random enzyme. And you can see that we destroyed, not destroyed, but we managed to cut a lot the polysaccharide here, the first cell walls that were um, very thin. So we increased pretty much uh, the uh, yield here with um, the yield of the juice with this enzyme, but we didn't really impact the thick cell walls. So the anthocyanin, the tannins are not really going to be extracted better than with the control. When we use a nozim crush, which I'm going to talk to you um, just after, uh, you can see that the focus here of um, developing a nozim crush was to make sure we go on every type of pectins. So we managed to break down the polysaccharide in all the cells, which really increase the extraction of tannins and anthocyanin. As you can see, all the cell walls are a little bit breakdown, but not completely destroyed. So we're not making it mushy either. 
just want to show you some results when we do use pectin. Uh, these are the same trial than uh, just before. We are looking at the color of the wine post malolactic. Uh, we used enzyme on the grapes. You can see that the con between the control and using the anosine crush after, uh, we increased a lot the uh, red category. And then the dot here is the polyphenol index. We increased a lot the content in phenolic compounds too. And here, um, I show you what we extracted in terms of polysaccharides because we are breaking down some polysaccharides which allow us to extract tannins and tocyanins, but not only, we also extract aromatic precursors, in fact, and we extract polysaccharides, not all of them. We are mostly focusing on the ARG2, which are a group of polysaccharides that are very uh, positive in terms of stabilization, mouthfeel and stabilization. Stabilization of color, but also stabilization of tartaric, for example, um, tartaric precipitation uh, is a big thing that we can stabilize with um, RG2 uh, polysaccharide. So here, when we do use our enzyme, as you can see, we are increasing a lot the extraction of this um, RG2 polysaccharide. Why it's important? Uh, that's why it's important. So tannins uh, will interact together. And as I was telling you before, some are very reactive. If they interact all together uh, and make a bowl like this, as you can see here, uh, this bowl is going to precipitate. They are making very big molecules, very heavy, not soluble. They drop. The idea is to keep them in suspension, to keep them in the wine. And for this, though, we need to stabilize them. Polysaccharides are playing a big role in stabilization. There is different way that polysaccharide can interact with tannin and tannin complex. As you can see here, there is different type of bonding. There is hydrogen bonded, there is hydrophobic uh, bonding, there is electrostatic bonds, you know, many different ways to do it. With polysaccharides, we like to focus on the hydrogen bonding, which is um, semi-permanent uh, bond so it can be broken but it's very hard to break so usually it stays stable in the wine unless you have like big ph changes uh, for example but usually it stays stable and it acts like this so basically you're making a circle around your tannin complex and you put your molecule stable in the wine it's there it's soluble and it's not gonna drop so you maintain your structure but you also cover it so to make it very smooth and you make, that's how the sensation in the palette become full and big. Okay, we have the structure, but it's not aggressive and we also have the roundness and softness of the polysaccharide. It happened that the RG2 um, polysaccharide are the best one to react with a um, polyphenol group or agglomerate. Okay, so using an enzyme such as an enzyme crush uh, will help you with this. So this one is an enzyme that is purified, so free of cinnamyl esterase and anthocyanase. Why this is important is because cinnamyl esterase can be uh, is an activity that will break down some um, hydroxycinamic acids um, into precursors of volatile phenols. So when your enzyme is not purified of cinnamylesterase, you will give bretanomyces precursors to produce bread taint, which you, you don't really want to do this. So this will help you keeping your wine cleaner with less risk of volatile phenols. Also, anthocyanidin is a side activity that break down anth anthocyanin and lose, make you lose color. So you don't want this either. So our enzymes are purified of these two activities. And what we are seeing in general is a pretty big in increase in terms of RG2 uh, release, so polysaccharide release, which will impact the mouthfeel and the stability of the color. Um, the amount of tannin that is released, the amount of uh, color index that we end up with in the final wine. Crag is the little pectins that are actually responsible of um, not be the wine not being able to clarify or filters. So when we use enzyme to cut this chain, 
we want to reduce the prag to make sure the wine is filtrable and clarify well. So this enzyme reduces uh, the amount of prag, so it does its job um, in terms of um, helping clarification. And then because we do this, we are releasing the cell walls, we are releasing more juice easily, we are increasing uh, the yield of um, free run uh, juice, so qualitative juice of about 4%. Of course, it varies, but usually we are between 3 and 6. The application is on grapes right at processing from 10 to 30 milliliters by ton, and it will really improve your color stability, your mouthfeel, your qualitative volume will be increased, and also it improves filtration and settling. So I highly recommend to use extraction enzyme um, because it's a very good way to help you managing your extraction and increasing your potential um, to maintain your grape potential and express it in the wine. The second part is, yes, now we extracted what we wanted from the grapes, we have to protect it because phenolic compounds are very reactive and they can be lost by oxidation and they can be lost by reaction with protein. So the idea is to protect them. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how to do this. First thing is, how, how do we lose these phenolics? I told you we can lose them with oxidation. As soon as they are extracted, um, in, they are in, so as soon as your berry start to be open, so it could be just, you know, as a de-steaming, if your de-steamer is not uh, good to maintain the integrity of the cluster or the berry or at crushing, and your uh, berries start to be open. There is introduction of oxygen in contact with the juice, so in contact with phenolic compounds, the reaction starts. There is uh, also enzymes such as the polyphenol oxidase and the lacase when there is botrytis that will accelerate all these reactions. Phenolic compounds become a quinone. This quinone will react with glutathione that is present in your grapes as a natural antioxidant. But also this quinone can react with phenolic compounds creating oxidation. That's what we see in apple, for example. Uh, this apple is uh, here cut it in two. We put sulfur on the white part and not on the other. But you all know what happens when you cut an apple, it gets oxidized. Same thing with banana skin, avocado. Same phenolic compounds, same enzyme in presence of oxygen. It happens exactly the same thing in juice or on grapes, and that's how we end up with big browning uh, issue and loss of phenolic compounds. And last, this quinone can react with aromas uh, when there is uh, in the process of oxidation. So today we focus on phenolic compounds. All I want to say here is we have to limit the amount of oxygen or we have to stop or pause, uh, inhibit the PPO and the lacase to make sure we protect our phenolic compounds from reacting with the quinone. The other thing that happen in, uh, especially in red wine, is the loss of phenolic compounds by reaction with protein. There is protein, as you see the little cloud in blue, and tannins, which are the red chain. They interact very well together. Actually, if you all um, make a little bit of white wine, you will know that we use fining agents that are protein-based to remove tannins. So we are adding a protein-based fining agent to bind with the tannins we don't want to remove them. In red wine, things happen um, exactly the same way, but we usually have it opposite. We want to keep the tannins. So we have to be careful with these proteins because they will bind with our tannins. They're extracted at the same time and they drop, making this big complex and precipitates. Uh, so we lose them. So we have to avoid this too. How do we do this? We usually use sacrificial tannins. Um, that's how we call them. They are tannins that are gonna uh, be added to the wine that will react with the oxygen, will get oxidized, and will um, react with protein and will precipitate instead of our own tannin. So they are really uh, sacrificing themselves to protect our own tannin from the grapes. Um, so our is called protanin R. It's a pure proanthocyanidic tannin, so very strong reaction with oxygen radical and high affinity with protein. Um, and to have you to show you an idea of how it works, you have your tannins from the grapes here, and here we are adding a sacrificial tannin, and we also have our tannin from the grapes. Okay, so we are having a control, 
and one with uh, protein R. We are going to have the protein, same content in both uh, grapes because we are having the same grapes here. The protein R is going to react first because it's a very high, it has a high affinity with protein. But basically, they are going to react, all this protein will react with tannin's presence. At the end, this reaction will precipitate. So it ends up that in the control, we really end up with a smaller amount than with the in the wine that we put the sacrificial tannin, where we saved all or most of our um, endogenous tannins. Okay, so when to use it, it's a product that you add at harvest. Um, if it's machine harvested, you can put it really on the grapes at this moment. Otherwise, you just put it on the bean, um, but as soon as possible, so it reacts um, faster and it protects the grapes fast sooner. Uh, it's a tannin that you don't have to solubilize. It's instantaneously soluble. So you just put it on the grapes. It's going to solubilize in the juice by itself. You can just sprinkle it. You would use it to remove proteins, to inhibit lacase and PPO, so to protect from oxidation. But also, it's going to, at the end, improve color stability, clarification. Um, it does show very good results in clarification. And it will preserve your grape potential, as you can see in the little animation here. We preserve most of our uh, phenolic uh, potential. I just want to show you some results here uh, from uh, this trial to um, give you some data on these concepts. Uh, but basically, here are analyses post malolactic control versus the one where we used our sacrificial tannin. And you can see that we end up with way more color saved. And mostly, it's the red compound that we saved. But also, the uh, green dot here is the final um, phenolic compound, post malo again. So the impact of what we did on grapes is huge on the final wine. Here is our amount of color, uh, but here is a color. It's a picture that is more obvious. This wine was having botrytis. I just prefer to say it. So that's why the control is very light in color, but also very cloudy. Lacase was present and uh, makes the wine very hard to um, deposit. Also, we lost a lot of color via oxidation, and it's kind of milky because of it. When we use tannins, and depending on the dosage, you can see that increasingly we have a better color, a better clarification, and a way better um, visual of the wine. It's not a short-term uh, stability that we are gaining here, because this is after the second racking, we are looking at the stability of the color. It's a test that we uh, check the NTU after a cold hold, and the lower is the NTU, the better um, the color is stable, the more stable is the color, sorry. And so you can see that with the control, we are not at all stable. When we added our tannins, we are still not stable because we need to be below 20, but we are way better. So second racking is usually happening in May. So you can see that even around May, we still have a way better stability of the color, better color, and better analysis in terms of number two. So that was our way to protect our color when we extract them. So we want to extract as soon as possible our anthocyanin and tannins, but we want to protect them. Otherwise, we are going to lose what we extracted. The last thing is that we want to stabilize them because they get very unstable and they react with everything. If they react with the wrong compounds, they are going to precipitate, such as a protein, for example. It's going to precipitate and we lose it. So we're going to lose what we did in the vineyard and what we did to extract and the protection part. So let's work on stability of the color. There is different way to stabilize color, different way that tannin and anthocyanin can interact together. The condensation, condensation, anthocyanin can interact with tannin via ethanol bridge. Ethanol is a molecule that is very essential in stabilization of color and is produced with the presence of oxygen, but yeast or bacteria can produce it too. That's a very good bond here, very stable and give us a color that is more on the purple um, side. Then we can have tannin anthocyanin with an oxygen uh, oxygen presence or anthocyanin tannin, sorry, 
with oxygen presence, that's a very nice red pink color that we will get, that direct bond. We have another direct bond that is tannin anthocyanin. This one is less interesting because it's actually keeping uh, some of the charge of the um, anthocyanin and it's not uh, fully stable. So it still can get oxidized and can get brown. And then we have the anthocyanin elagic tannin that uh, is an interesting bond. This happens during aging, usually when we put uh, wood or oak uh, presents. The second part is the copigmentation. Copigmentation is usually not as long-term stable, but it's not uh, true all the time. Uh, but it's usually faster to react to happen in the wine, and it's not as yeah, it's a short-term stabilization. It does have a hyperchromic effect, which means you are increasing the the visual intensity of um, of the color of the wine. So you don't necessarily increase the um, numbers, but you increase the visual aspect of it. And it has a batochromic effect, which means we are changing the hue and the hue becomes more purple, red purple, uh, dense um, color. This will happen with flavanols, so the molecules we talked about at the beginning, beginning, which are like basically direct bond with some tannins, uh, yeast manoprotein, and polysaccharide. To give you an example of the yeast manoprotein, when we age wine uh, on lees, we are usually seeing a more stable color um, after aging, after long aging. That's because the manoprotein from the yeast cell was released, and these are interacting with other anthocyanins, making the wine more stable. Okay, so interaction on copigmentation happen as you can see in this little uh, graph here. There is a pigment, there is a copigment. Pigment is anthocyanin, and they are going to interact as a sandwich form. So you basically need two of them for one anthocyanin, and it takes it as a sandwich. And there is bonds that are um, attractive and repulsive in the same time. So it's going to stay like this. It's staying stable. That's why it's not a long-term stability, but it's still a very good way to stabilize our anthocyanin. So I want to focus on the uh, first molecule I talked about, which is the anthocyanin ethanol tannin bridge. That's one of the best molecules we can get for stability of color. We need ethanol for this. When do we get ethanols? At the beginning of fermentation, yeast are going to produce it, uh, as you can see uh, here in this graph, in the first few days. Then yeast is going to consume it. So we have a window here until like day five, six of fermentation to act on this. Usually we don't have tannins at this point. That's why enzymes are very important because we are extracting more tannins. Um, and that's why the temper when we ferment at high temperature, we are increasing the production of ethanol. That's why it helps with um, also polymeric pigment. On the end of the fermentation, the ethanol is consumed as the yeast. That's not really where we are going to uh, make this bond. During malolactic, bacteria are consuming ethanol too. Post malo, we can play with microoxygenation to create ethanols and start to um, work on doing these bonds. Okay, so during fermentation is a good window, especially at the beginning of fermentation. Malolactic is not so much a good time. And then aging is a very good time, but we have to work on microox. And uh, usually at this tape, we use uh, wood. We developed a tannin that is uh, great for this, that will really help stabilizing, that has a high stabilizing effect at the beginning of fermentation. To create these tannins, we actually work on um, different uh, steps. But the main test we look at was uh, a test of polymerization by ethanol, since we are talking about ethanol. So we take a solution of tannins, we are putting ethanols, and we are looking at uh, the appearance of the haze. The haze intensity is going to tell us how efficient is the tannin to bind through ethanol bond. The haze appearance speed, so how fast the haze come, is telling us how uh, fast the tannin can react. Okay, So we are measuring the haze intensity and speed 
um, of appearance to understand how efficient is our tannin and how good it is to react with, to fix color. And this is what we came out with. So basically we looked at catechins, we look at grape tannins, and then we end up uh, developing our soft tannin vinification that is a catechin bonded to a polysaccharide. So catechins are great to uh, bind with polys with color, but as you can see, they don't they are um, they are great, but they are not the best. Basically, grape tannin are re reacting even better, but the best on this trial was the soft tannin vinification. So we work on catechin. We know these molecules are very good to bind color. They are also very aggressive, so they usually um, gives you a mouthfeel that is not the most pleasant. So we bond it with polysaccharide to round up the mouthfeel to help with the meat palate, but also to make the molecule stable. Catechin by itself is not really stable, so that's why they are not the best. They stabilize very good, but then they can drop. So bind it with a plain polysaccharide, they are fully stable and soluble in the wine. So we make a molecule that is done there and will stay. Okay, so we recommend to apply uh, soft and vinification early in fermentation, 150 to 200 gram, gram per ton. I want to show you a result of trial where we uh, added a soft and vinification on a Grenache thermovinified. You can see the color here. Uh, this is on the final wine. You have the control and the one with the soft and V. Um, it's pretty obvious uh, the intensity of the color is way better when we added the tannin. Six months after um, fermentation, we are looking at the loss of color. And as you can see, we lost way more color in the control than in the wine where we added the tannins. So our color that we increased here, the intensity, we also stabilized it. And in terms of mouthfeel, because we managed to keep this color, but we also gave uh, catechin and polysaccharide that are responsible of meat palate, we really increase the balance, the complexity, the structure, the softness, the length, and the aromatic intensity of the wine uh, just by adding this tannin. So it's not only on the color, but also um, good results on uh, the mouthfeel and the aromas. Other results on a Pinot from Burgundy and on a Cab from Bordeaux. So you can see we did thermovinified Grenache, Pinot from Burgundy, Cab from Bordeaux. So many different grape variety and conditions and kind of always the same result. Here you can see with the Pinot, we increased up 7% the content in um, the IPT, so the total phenolic index and 9% in the Cab. Color intensity got increased uh, quite a lot, actually. 16% uh, on the Pinot, 13% in the cab. And then the color stability. So here, again, we are looking, this is three months post um, malolactic. We are looking at the evolution of the color. And so we are having a way better um, color stability on uh, the wine. So yeah, actually way better. Didn't put percentage because they were actually very big percentage, um, but you can see it by yourself. We are um, more stable when we use uh, soft and V. This is a drop of color that we're looking at. Second uh, type of stabilization of the um, color in winemaking. So during fermentation or post fermentation in this case, we can play with copigmentation and yeast manoprotein. So we know manoprotein are interacting with phenolic compounds as a stabilizer. There is many uh, papers on this, many research on this, and we visually see it when we age our wine on lees. Then there is different type of manoprotein that will react in different ways. Um, you will see it with different yeast, different yeast lees will not give you the same result. So here to show you, there is different trial we did with two different manoprotein, and we are looking at the gelatin index, which is an indicator of astringency, PVPP index, which is an indicator of color stability, and ethanol index, which is an indicator of sweetness. These three things are usually what manoprotein does. Manoprotein can reduce astringency, 
increased col protein uh, color stability and sweetness. Here are the numbers on the control. You can see that the first nanoprotein we used reduced a bit the astringency, improved a little bit the color stability and the sweetness. But then when we work with the second nanoprotein, we have a huge impact on reducing astringency, increasing color stability, and increasing sweetness perception. So knowing this, we did our own work and we came out with uh, so we came out with um, Nature Soft. Nature Soft is a product that is a yeast derivative rich in manoprotein that we selected to really stabilize color first and then uh, work on the most field in terms of reduction of astringency and increasing roundness and sweetness of the wine. Uh, but today we talk about color, so I'm showing you mostly color results. Here again, we are um, looking at the stability of the color. Um, once we are ready to basically bottle at this stage, um, so nature soft has been added during fermentation, and we are looking at the results months and months after. Um, the control has a color that is not stable. Remember, we need a delta NTU that is below 20 to consider it stable. We uh, added nature soft in fermentation and we completely have a color, a stable, a color that is fully stable. And then we added other leaves uh, from other people, which didn't stabilize fully the wine. It helps, but it didn't stabilize it fully. And if we look at the mouse field perception, using um, nature soft will drastically reduce astringency, reduce dryness increase roundness and sweetness in the palate. And in this example here, I'm showing you again uh, the Delta NTU, which is another uh, wine here, where the control is not stable, while the one with Nature Soft is stable. So Nature Soft has a huge impact on stabilizing color uh, early in the early stage. So it's going to do a co-pigmentation, uh, release manoprotein that will promote the co-pigmentation with anthocyanin, that will help with a long-term, actually, um, color stability here. Then we are talking post-fermentation here. We can still do condensation. As you remember, if we play with microox, we really can uh, promote ethanol again and do condensation uh, here. We developed another tannin for condensation uh, with ethanol on when we are talking post-fermentation, which is a tan excellence. It's a blend of grape tannin and oak tannin here. Um, and I want to show you a result of different products we have that I talked about today and color stability. So soft and V, we just talked about, and you can see here we are looking at in uh, yellow, the um, color index post-fermentation uh, and then in dark green uh, three months after. The control lost pretty good amount of color uh, and started with an index color that is actually lower. When we put the soft NV, we have a better color index, so we stabilized our color. And um, we lost a little bit, but not much, in fact, uh, during these three months. Oak chips, because oak chips are known to help color stability. Um, many people use oak granular and oak chips during fermentation. It does help, as you can see, we are increasing the color intensity, but it's not a stable color. As you can see, we are losing a lot during three months of um, aging, just because the oak chips are also fixing the color. Uh, you probably all realized if you use oak chips before that when you look at your chips, they are red or pink. The color of these chips that is red is this color that is not in the wine anymore. So. You stabilize by giving some tannins, but you fix some as well. So when you remove your chips, uh, you are losing some color in the wine. So it helps, but it's not at all the best option here. Nature Soft, we just talked about it. It has a similar effect than Soft and V. Uh, as you can see, we are having a better color, but then we lose also a little bit, not much during aging, but still um, we do. And then we developed tan excellence that is made to add during microox, um, where in fact, post uh, you can see post malo we don't have a huge impact on adding tan excellence. But then three months after, we managed to create some bonds that have uh, an intensive, like 
it has a batochromic effect and a hyperchromic effect that will um, that show you basically a better color intensity. So all these tools, my conclusion here is all these tools are great. You can use them in, combi in combination or not. Um, just the chips are not the best option, as you can see. But Soft V, Nature Soft, or Tan Excellence will be three products that really work good in terms of stabilizing your potential and then maintaining it through time. So in conclusion, on uh, color stability, we have our potential from the grapes. Let's consider it as 100% potential. And what we want is to extract all this, protect all this, and stabilize all this. So first uh, step, use a distimer that is qualitative that will give you entire berries and gentle on the clusters. You want to protect your the tannins you extracted. So for, you can use uh, an ozyme crush or an ozyme crush red in this case, to uh, improve the extraction from the skin. And you use protanin R to protect all these uh, tannins and anthocyanins that has been extracted. During fermentation, you want to stabilize uh, these steps with soft tannin vinification and nature soft. So manoproteins and tannin that has been developed for uh, being highly reactive with anthocyanin and small tannins to make sure you stabilize them. Then usually that's when you press. And after pressing, we are talking about another type of stabilization with this ethanol bond with tan excellence uh, that will stay during aging and as a small, not as fast reaction as during fermentation because the ethanol is not produced as fast. Okay, so extraction, protection, stabilization are the three main focus here. And um, really what you want to do to focus on your uh, expressing and keeping your full potential in phenolic compounds. I put some options here that are, of course, different yeast. Uh, Excellence B Nature is an alternative to sulfur to protect uh, your uh, grapes from um, microbial development. And then Kilbret will be the same. It's a ketosan to protect your wine from microbial development essential as well. We talk about color, but there is also a lot of other topic to talk about um, because we still make wine in a global way. Uh, so we want to focus on aromatic expression and also uh, microbial stability. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I It was a bit longer than I was expecting. I'm sorry about this. I hope you all enjoyed it and I'm free for questions. Thank you, Meglandine. Thank you so much. This was such a great um, talk, so practical and easy to follow and easy to understand on a not easy to understand topic. Um, so really appreciate it. Um, great talk. So we're opening this up uh, for questions. Um, and we do have one question. But before I read the question, I just want to say thank you to all the people who are attending from the States. It's a holiday. I didn't realize it was a holiday when I uh, first scheduled this, but I appreciate you being here. And then a shout out to all the international attendees as well. Um, I see we have people from all over the world attending. So appreciate that. And the question is about the enzyme crush. Is it only when the phenolic maturity is complete or near to be completed? If it is not completed, what could we do? So that's an excellent question. Uh, so of course, it's better when you achieve phenolic maturity. When you don't, uh, it's true that sometimes we want to, when you don't, let's imagine you do have a lot of uh, green tannins. Very commonly, when you don't achieve maturity in terms of phenolic compounds, we are talking about the seeds that are not mature, but the skin are still positive. So we still want to use an ozyme crush to extract from the seeds. And in this case, you would really be gentle with your cap management. You will definitely not do... Um, extended maceration and you probably want to even press early to uh, as soon as you are happy with the extraction of phenolic compounds you just press basically um because it's it's very commonly um the skin are still mature with nice phenolic compounds what you don't want is the seeds so you do want to be very gentle in alcoholic environment but you want to extract as much as you can on a water base uh, environment to bind with your anthocyanin. 
Thank you. Any other questions? You can type them in the chat box or the Q&A. Okay, you have another question from Richard. If you only have the ability or budget to focus on one area of the crush, fermentation or post press, which one would be the best to focus on for color stabilization? Fermentation. Fermentation. I would recommend fermentation because that's where even early fermentation, actually not at the end, that's where you really have your uh, anthocyanin that came out, come out and your tannin are not there yet. So that's where you really have um, you, all your potential extracted and you need to do something. If you don't do this, the post-fermentation, you will have less to focus on because you already lost a lot of compounds. So yeah, ferment, definitely early fermentation. Thank you for um, that answer. Any other questions? Um, I actually had a question um, waiting for uh, to see if we have more from the participants. You spoke about polysaccharides and how they help with color stability. My question is in high pH wines like the ones we have in Texas, um, are the polysaccharides, um, is their structure affected and do you see a change in their effectiveness in color protection? That's, uh, that's very, very good. Um, we actually didn't see a difference. Uh, so what we see in high pH is the, so it's not about the effectiveness of the polysaccharide. What we're seeing is the color is different because in high pH, the, co the visual color is not as purple. It's more, uh, it's a red, it's a kind of a, a tired red, yep, you know. That's right. Um, so, but that's anthocyanin that express differently. Then uh, in high pH, there is yeah the charge is less uh, less important, so the reaction is gonna be slower. Okay. And so to bond, and the other thing that happen is the reaction to bond is slower, but the reaction to oxidize is faster. So we do have to um, the impact you know the bond still create and the bond is still as stable. We still see it in the long term. What we see is just that we have to act way faster because it's the oxygen is here and it goes faster because the pH is higher. And also the color, this, there is nothing to do except lowering the pH, but the color is not as purple. Yeah, yeah, and it's a big problem in high pH areas. Yes. Yeah, um, and from what I understand, we see this high pH issue happening more and more around the world due to the climate change situation. So I think uh, a lot of a lot more people will become interested in this topic as as things unfold. Completely, unfortunately, it's actually you know on high pH we usually I prefer to work with tannins, not necessarily for the efficiency of the of of the molecule, but for the impact on the palate. Because when you are in high pH environment, usually your palate is a little bit more flabby yep, and absolutely. heavy. Yep. And when you add polysaccharides, you increase roundness and sweetness, which makes the wine even more um, heavy yeah. in a way. While tannins can balance this heaviness and, and give like some direction and some tension to the wine, will help. it will help balancing the wine in terms of mouthfeel too. So... It's completely a different topic, but I usually prefer to work with tannins um, because of the most field. Yeah, that makes sense, actually. Yeah. Um, and I guess final question from me. I don't see any other questions from the attendees. Um, how do you feel about microox and oak alternatives in general? We we are seeing very good results. Um, it's uh, you know post. So I'm I'm more into the post fermentation. A stage post malo. If you do it well, you can have very good results. You just have to be extremely careful uh, with um, the amount of oxygen you put and the amount of oak you put because both of them can impact mouthfeel. One more time, in high pHs, it's not the best. It's too dangerous. I would say it's too dangerous in high pH uh, because it goes too fast and from one day to the other you really can oxidize your wine. But when you manage to have a lower pH situation, it gives very good results in color stabilization. Thank you. 
So final call for questions or comments at this point. Um, if not, I'm going to ask you again to please take one minute uh, to fill out the survey that's going to pop up um, after this webinar is concluded. And uh, I'd like to take a minute to thank Eglantine again for an early uh, holiday day <laughs> uh, webinar on tannins. Thank you, Eglantine. Really appreciate it. Um, and I wish you all a good day and I'll see you all next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.